Hello, I'm Lux. And I'm Ember. And this is our thoughts on Ruby, Volume 6, Chapter 13, Season Finale, which I believe was called Our Way. We'll probably talk about the particular after credit scene later, but man, do they reference the Wizard of Oz? And I'm pretty sure she actually is based on one of the Wicked Witches, so it kind of makes sense. So, wow. That's a pretty good final episode for the season. And I was hoping for her to turn around. Meeting Cordova and her giant robot, and I think she finally realized it was partially her fault. Well, she kept screaming, it's your fault, it's your fault, she's having a breakdown. But, you know, Ruby gets to fit in one more speech, and she gets to do it over the military comm. Which means that Cordova hears, not only are these brats who were trying to steal her ship and run away, not running away, but they're going to attack the Leviathan without support. Because we're huntresses, this is what we do. Yeah, that is exactly what they do. I was also wondering if Ruby was going to remember how to use her powers, and not just focus on, yeah, killing the big bat. And nice trick of using Jin there. The genie now respects you. <laughs> also, I wonder if that was a reference back to Aladdin. It could be the, um, yeah, but no more freebies. Like, I will not allow you to use me without a question, even if it was clever. And I like the style for all the memories she was pulling up. It was very 2D in its presentation, but there was definitely a lot of 3D models used in it, and the shading was what gave it a kind of flat appearance of a hand-animated scene. And a little touch at the end there of Summer. Yeah, it was a nice way to kind of have them as a flashback style, almost like a yearbook style, hmm. the way the stills were, you know, and focusing on both the positive and the bitter. And I like that she failed the first time because she's only used the power a couple of times and she's never pulled it off consciously. So failing makes sense. And in a way, I think she also failed the second time, even though she set it off. Because the Grim was just imprisoned in stone, not actually fully destroyed. Because the Grim that was on top of Beacon Tower is still encased in stone, and I'm thinking it's about the same size as a, as a Leviathan, so there's a whole lot more power going on there. So this is the first time she does it consciously, so it does make sense that it would be weaker than any of the times she's done subconsciously. But she bought time, which is what she said she would do. So she at least managed to follow through on that part. Also, when Cordova pulled out the giant drill, all I could think of, pierce the heavens! Yeah. <laughs> believe in me that believes in you! <laughs> oh, don't believe in yourself. Believe in me. Believe in the me that believes in you. Ah, uh, that is a... That is a pretty great anime. It just goes over the top, above and beyond, and doesn't care that it does so. And in case you don't realize the anime we're talking about, it's Goron Lagon. Do a search. Enjoy. And I like all the little things that happen in this episode. All the looks towards each other, all the we got this kind of looks, and the hugs, and... A great deal of non-verbal communication. You know, following the whole show, don't tell. And the whole, oh, we missed this time. We got to swing around. How are we going to do this? Looks over at Wise. Wise goes, he's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and it's interesting how she wasn't actually riding the summon. Yeah, she was managing to control it remotely. Entirely remotely. Which does make sense because if you look at her ground-bound summons, the boar and the knight... She's typically not in physical contact with them, but you have to wonder what her range is for projecting the summons. And how does she mentally control where it goes? Because she couldn't see a lot of the battlefield from where she was in the ship. Well, does she consciously have to control the creature the whole time, or is she just able to give it a set of instructions as part of the summoning spell and move on? Hmm. What are some of the points you'd like to bring up? I love that Miss Calaveras is like, I hate to be the bad guy, but this would be an awesome opportunity to leave. And that little smile when 
the team turns her down. Mm-hmm. I caught that, too. She actually, Amber actually looked over at me. Did you catch that smile? I'm like, yep. I didn't say it out loud at the time, but I was like, I was thinking to myself, yeah, I did catch that smile. <laughs> but I was kind of intently focused on the episode because I was slightly spoiled by an image that I just recently saw in thumbnails in Google News. Oi. It was the exact image of Summer Rose standing there. I was like, oh, God, do we actually... <laughs> Yeah, I saw that in my feed as well. Because so far, like, a lot of people that I watch on YouTube respect spoilers. So when they're thumbnails, they don't show anything really important. Or they hint at something important, but they leave it up to you to go, hmm. They don't just blatantly use straight up spoiler images from the show. And then suddenly, usually like three days later, everyone's using spoiler images in their thumbnails. Not the ones I follow, but Google's like, you, you like Ruby, right? Thank, thank you, Google. No, I don't need those. I do like Ruby, but I want to be surprised by stuff, Ru Ruby. <laughs> Google? Yeah. Yeah, but I'm glad it wasn't as big a surprise or reveal as I thought it might be from the thumbnail I saw. It was just yet another one of the things that Ruby was thinking about to try and put herself in the silver eye power mindset. And... I think this is the first time we've actually seen her with her hood down, Summer Rose. And I understand why they probably had the hoods, the hood up in other shots of her because they were hiding the whole Silver Eyes mythos from us. And it makes me wonder, like, how often did her mom use her powers or did her mom even activate her powers? She may not have because just because you have the capability doesn't mean you ever use it. And if she hadn't used it, did she use it during the time she died? May have. And is that the reason she's dead? And I still don't think that the hunt for silver-eyed maidens or people at all, silver-eyed people at all, is done by Salem. I think it's definitely someone else. It's just, it doesn't make any sense for Salem to want to go after the silver-eyed peoples as bad as they're actually being going, gone after. Because if that was one of Salem's primary goals, they would have gone after Ruby a lot more strongly. Especially after the fact that she kind of revealed herself to be a silver-eyed warrior. But they've clearly said, at least Salem, don't touch her. So that's something interesting. Well, was the don't touch Ruby because Cinder was getting too obsessed? And speaking of Cinder, interesting... And we finally get to see Neapolitan's power in person. I don't think they've ever shown what it looks like before. Her outfit changed, and it sounds like she can materialize stuff and not just make it look like something else. Yeah, it does sound like it has more of a physical aspect to it, which is interesting because if she could just cast a seeming over it, that wouldn't really make her much different from Emerald. And what would be the point of duplicating powers when you have the entirety of your imagination as a creator to come up with powers? I like the effect for the transformation, too. Lots of fractals. Reminded me of some of the Jinlock imagery. So another instance of possibly seeing some of the cross-pollination between the animation styles. And I like Cinder's new outfit. Nice design. New eye mask, which is interesting. And the cut of the outfit and the cloak. Still pretty much in her signature color scheme. But not particularly warm considering her warning to Neo about the temperature where they were headed. Which is a nice off-handed way to give us more ideas about how Neo's powers work. You need to materialize yourself. You should probably materialize yourself some boots. They give us a better idea of like, oh, so it's more of a physical thing. These objects have physicality to them. It's not just a projection. And that's a good way to subtly hint at something. Like how I was kind of slightly complaining about Blake shouting, Blake! Blake shouting, Adam's power works like this! Which made sense in context of the fight scene, as we said previously. But from a story standpoint, sounds a lot like an info dump. And the way they introduced Neo's power here and mentions how it works, is much more seamless. It's like, oh, I got it now. They didn't have to tell us directly. 
was the character having a conversation going, oh, you should use your power to do this. And it gave us an idea, oh, oh, so it's not just, ah. Because it's not like we haven't seen Neo in action before. I mean, she was even part of the medical crew when Mercury had his fake out during the Vital Festival. So you have to go back and wonder, okay, how much of that was real, how much of that was Emerald, and how much of that was Neo? Hmm. Yeah, because it probably was a combination of a lot of different things. Because if you have two powers like that, that could work in tandem with each other to really create a scene. I'm not just talking about the scene. I'm talking about, you know, did they mask the medical unit? Was it, you know, something entirely different under the base form? Hmm. And, hmm. Who in fairy tales takes one thing and turns it into another? The fairy godmother. Hmm. Cinderella. But I wouldn't exactly match Neo up with the fairy godmother. Hmm. Though Cinder is based on Cinder, Cinder, Cinder is based on Cinderella. And so Neo now helping Cinder with her goal mm -hmm. is a little fairy godmother-like. Because, hmm. hmm, Cinder has a new outfit. Neo has provided the transportation. And transfer and transformed it into something else. Or mm -hmm. will. To provide them coverage. So, Cinder's got the dress and she's got the coach. So I wonder if there's a limit to midnight on this. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt it, but I think if Neo's concentration is too broken or her mental state becomes too unstable, Daddy, then there may be some issues. What was your favorite scene out of this episode? Ruby and Jen. <laughs> yeah, that that is one of my favorites too. There's a lot of little moments I really like as well. Specifically the one where Ruby looks to Wise and Wise is like, oh. And specifically another wonderful scene is the one at the end where everyone's like looking at her and she goes, what? 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 <laughs> Isn't it like you guys haven't done crazy stuff? Like, yeah, we've been watching the past five seasons. You guys have all done crazy stuff. Mm-hmm. And like, Oscar, Oscar! It's like, uh, well, actually... Which answers the question of how did the ship manage to not crash when I was thinking it was more Miss Calaveras, but it was actually Osben. Mm-hmm. And he didn't trick... And he didn't take full control. He just made suggestions. Like, calm down. You've got this. Do this. Which is much better than the forceful taking over that he did during the fight with Salem's goons previously. And yes, he would be watching you. He may not even be, he may not even have a choice to not watch you guys. He can not pay attention all the time, but he probably is seeing whatever Oscar is seeing and hearing whatever is Oscar's hearing, but whether or not he's paying attention to it is the key. Like, Oscar reacting like he did probably made Ozpin notice. He's feeling this panicked, you know, fight or flight response in the body he's inhabiting. Oh, crud. Okay, hang on. You got this. Really don't want to have to reincarnate again this soon. So I think we're gonna see Ozpin more next season. And maybe we'll actually get a little bit more character development from Oscar as well. And it would be nice if during next season we actually get to see what happened off screen when Oscar left. Yes, I would very l much like to know how the time when Oscar left the house and came back with new clothes actually went. Because I'd like to go, okay, where did he get the money? For one thing. Because when he was trying to travel to get to Crow, he didn't even have, you know, the money to get the ticket. He had trouble with finances then and i can't imagine that team ruby just went here hold our collective purse maybe since they're in a big city he knew something about ozpen and was able to go to a, like a bank branch or something and withdraw funds but that also implies that there's more merging or sharing going on there so i really want to know what happened during that off-screen time and it was actually nice to hear ozpen again I really like that voice actor. And that song that was playing during the credits was really good. Didn't catch most of the lyrics, but it sounded like a really powerful ballad song. 
it's a lot of, okay, you won the battle, but I'll win the war. And I'm betting the song is actually called Nevermore because they keep coming back to the phrase Nevermore, which is really interesting because Raven hasn't been around this season. Hmm. Hmm. Good point, especially since a lot of the songs for Ruby are from perspectives of characters. And a lot of it was about taking back what was theirs, also defending home. It's like, oh no, we're not waging a war, we're just defending ourselves. Hmm. Yeah, when the soundtrack comes out, I'm definitely going to be listening to it a lot. And not just for the fact that the songs are good, but because like, so that's what they were talking about. <laughs> yeah, the, oh, I get it now, and oh my god, wow, I totally missed that. Yeah, I mean, I, I recently went back and listened to some season one songs and went, oh, shoot. <laughs> wow, they had some of this stuff planned out really far in advance. Because they're talking about a lot of it in these songs. Yeah, well, we heard, you know, kind of early on that they had it planned out for, I want to say, 10 volumes. Though there have been a lot of changes along the way i think they're still holding to the larger overarching arcs yeah the core story they want to tell but they're letting the characters develop themselves and change with how they want to be written as it were because sometimes your characters just don't cooperate you go i really want to do this thing why why won't my pen move <laughs> or every time you write the scene you're like that doesn't work at all why doesn't that scene work or as I like to say when I'm drawing, why is this character fighting me? I just want to make them pretty. <laughs> Change the pose entirely. Gosh darn it. You couldn't have just told me you wanted to be drawn like this. So, so yeah, I, I do talk to my drawings a lot. It may not be out loud, but in my head I'm like, why? Why are you fighting me? Or, oh, you're being really nice. Oh, you look lovely. <laughs> or, oh my god, you look creepy. You're not supposed to look creepy. Blog, goth, blog. <laughs> Just a little. Also, a particular character from the most recent season of My Little Pony. Like, whoa. Whoa, you're not supposed to look. Whoa. I mean, it's My Little Pony. And then there's those drawings where, wow, that came out really creepy. Perfect. Specifically, one particular drawing for this volume of Ruby. Yes, yes, your, your apathy would give me nightmares. It's given me plenty already. Twitch, twitch. <laughs> Oh, well, you're the one who drew it, so you're like, Ooh, how was this darkness hiding inside of me? Creepy. <laughs> uh, any other points you'd like to go over? Small nitpick that Blake and Yang were able to run that fast after the fight they just had. Yeah, and how long it took Yang to get there on a motorcycle. When she was closer to begin with, because she was basically there as Blake's backup. So, one, they can't have possibly been running the entire time, and two, I would not have expected that level of speed with the battle they had and the injuries they took. Yeah, I thought the same thing, too. It's like, are they going to make it back in time? Oh, yeah, they are. Of course they are, but... But they looked a little too energetic when they got there. And going back to reasons of why the team with the ship didn't just try to outfly Cordova and run away. It's because they still had two members on the ground. And they were having trouble getting them on calm, I believe. So, yeah. Even though we've already split the team once this season, you don't really want to do it when you're leaving a kingdom. And speaking of kingdoms, whoa, I didn't expect a whole chunk of it to be off the ground. Atlas does look visually impressive, and wow, the military array, and thank you for letting us know that that was so incredibly unexpected-wise, because we haven't spent a lot of time in Atlas, so... Yeah, and it's kind of interesting how Atlas welcomed that ship, saying welcome back. W yeah, welcome home. Do they know who's on board? Did Cordova radio ahead? I don't know, because it sounded like they identified the ship by ship number, not by any of the occupants. So maybe Cordova at the most, well, no, because she said she was going to leave out their ship in her very lengthy report. 
So Cordova couldn't have sent any official communications, but Atlas may have been getting information from Argus that they were under attack. And going back to the attack real quick, I like how we got to see a lot of close-ups of the people, and specifically Jean's family. <laughs> uh, and the reaction of the kid <laughs> when I think it was Cordova, after Cordova drills mm -hmm. the Grim, full hands up, woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, that was pretty awesome considering you were right there watching the Grim advance on your city. Because it already got through two of the barriers. And when it broke through the second barrier, it was able to cause property damage. So that meant that by the time it got through the second barrier, everyone was in danger because they were within firing range. And the Grim was very kaiju in design. Specifically one particular kaiju I can think of. One of the most famous, actually. <laughs> Especially with that laser blast. Yeah, it looked more like a fire blast, though. It had a lot of fire in it to be a laser. Yeah, I was mostly referring to the style. <laughs> Not that was an actual laser. Very big horizontal blast, lots of energy, big impact. Also, the framing of the scene where Ruby almost gets chopped. And it sounds like Yang was trying to warn Ruby from, like, um, the... Grim's not following us anymore? Yeah, well, it also sounded like Yang was going, hurry up and do it, which is a distraction when someone's trying to come up with an appropriate state of mind. Though I think dropping the comm unit in the water was a little overboard, just turn it off. Ah, but there was some really nice camera angles in this episode, and the style, and the way they were shooting certain things really, really added some nice tension to the scene. They're really showing that they're really starting to dial in on how they want to use this program. But there, there are some interesting animation details, and I'll go back to the splash when Adam fell in the water, because that was very jarring in terms of the animation textures. To go to the final tidbit scene with Salem... And when she's pulling up the red and black energy at the end as she's creating yet another gorilla grim that she will add wings to, that was very liquid and looked very different texturally than what we saw in the rest of the scene. Yeah, I think that was used in that way to create more of a contrast and a visual cut for us because that's the end of it. And speaking of water effects, the way the water fell off the Grim was really well done. As yeah. the Grim was coming back out of the water, it looked really good to me. That whole kind of old saying, if you want something done right, do it yourself. She's creating those Grim to specifically do her bidding, but that's not quite the same as doing it yourself. I think she's actually going to do it herself. She's just bringing an army of flying monkeys. Oh, I'm sorry. Flying gorillas. Monkeys would be too small for what she wants to do. I mean, if you're going to create a grim, why, why would you create a small one? And also interesting that her headquarters are by the Dark God's pool. Also that that pool still exists, because okay, does the God of Light's pool still exist? I don't know if that was specifically the Dark God's Pool. It may not have been, but Grim came from the Dark God's Pool. We've seen that. We've also seen them come out of smaller puddles around the area, specifically at the beginning, I think, of last volume. But still, it's interesting. Because, I mean, when you saw Emerald walking up to Mercury, you knew Mercury was staring at something going, what the... And I'm like, Emerald, will you hurry up and notice so that the camera will pan and show the audience? <laughs> yeah, sometimes you're shouting at the characters on screen, not because you want them to survive or anything. You're like, show us what they're looking at! Because I'm like, I want to see. And then they first show, like, climbing up out of the pool. My first thought was actually, does Salem dive into that thing on a regular basis to rejuvenate? <laughs> oh, nope. Nope, we're, yeah, grim. And adding the wings 
interesting. So you can't fully create what you want while it's in the pool or you go to create something and then you tweak it. How does that work? Because we see all of them there and they all basically look alike. So she's able to do it consistently. Maybe she can just call forth a specific form and then after it's out, she alters it? Could be. And also after she finished tweaking it, it seemed to be more tame towards her where it didn't seem tame when it first came out. This is all getting quite interesting. I do like where it's going. It's like, okay, who is she going to carry off? Because traditionally that's what you have the flying monkeys do is carry people off. Or is this just going to be an attack? Is it going to be flying monkeys versus Atlas military? <laughs> that would be interesting to watch. And going back to the Atlas military real quick, what are they expecting? Well, from what we heard in previous seasons, uh, some people were saying that Ironwood was getting a little paranoid. So they're kind of braced for an attack. But what quarter that attack is supposed to come from. And I can't wait to see more of Atlas. Yeah, because most of what we've seen in Atlas revolve very much around Wise's family and a bit with Ironwood and the overall council. We didn't get to do much walking down the streets of Atlas. I don't know if we're going to get much opportunity for that when you're greeted by the entire Atlas military in a positive manner. I'm betting you're basically going to be docking directly into an Atlas military stronghold. And does that mean we're going to see winter pretty quickly next season? Next volume? I would suspect so, because if all the Atlas air support military has been called back, there isn't really anywhere else for the Atlas military members to be, unless she's on some sort of mission. Because Ironwood was Osbin's trusted, and Winter is Ironwood's trusted. So if he was going to send someone out on some sort of mission, it's going to be Winter. So it will be interesting to see what happens in Atlas. Also what Salem is up to. Because Salem sent two of her generals out on an errand. So did they fail and she's doing this because they failed? Or is she working on a separate task from what they're working on? Also, I'm interested to see what was cut out of that little tidbit because there's always a piece missing. You know, when we get to see it again next season, there'll be more. There'll be something we didn't get to see before. We'll see. Yes. Next volume, which is going to be a pain to wait for because I was enjoying this, but our overall schedule... We'll be grateful that another show is on hiatus and maybe we can watch something else that we're behind on. <laughs> oh, we've got so much to choose from. Mm -hmm. Just to get caught up on things that we're already watching. Leaving aside things that we are interested in watching and haven't gotten to yet. And that's regardless of whether or not we actually record stuff to put on the internet. Because we do sometimes watch stuff without telling you guys. I know the horror. Okay, well, that was a nice season finale. Definitely can't wait for next volume myself. Well, this has been our thoughts on Ruby, Volume 6, Chapter 13, Our Way. Oh, hey, not only the end of this season, but the end of this episode. Welcome. And... Yeah, not much new to say. Uh, like, subscribe, share, comment, ring the bell, watch other videos. Even those of you who've been with us for a long time, you probably haven't seen all of them. Uh, we do have them in playlist form. We have two overarching formats. We have the ones with Lux's time lapse, and then we have the ones where we read children's stories. That even has its own name. Ember's Reading Room. Yay, children's books with commentary and analysis because fair use. Also, no, because of fair use, we will never post all of the pictures from a story. Just reiterating that because I, I get that a lot. 
You want to see more of Lux's art? We have links for that. You want to support the channel monetarily? We have links to Lux's Patreon, Lux's Coffee, Lux's Zazzle. Also, uh, we sometimes have some of product links that give us a small kickback if you click and buy. So if you don't want to pay us directly, you can make a purchase and pay us indirectly, not out of your pocket. How's that? You get something, we get something. It's all good. Thank you so much for watching and listening. We appreciate all of the support that we receive in the form of views, likes, comments, dialogues, suggestions, and of course financially as well. But all of it is truly appreciated. Thank you to all of our supporters, subscribers, etc. in whatever form you choose to grace us with your presence.